Hello again and welcome back or welcome for the first time for anyone who's new here. We are doing our five minute Bible study series. We do one every day. We talk about one chapter of the Bible every day and the goal is to go through the whole Bible. Today we are on 2 Kings chapter 10. But if you need to catch up, all the PDFs are available to download for free on the website and the videos are up on YouTube and on the website. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 10 today. We're continuing the story of Jehu. Remember, he killed Jehoram and Amaziah in the last chapter to become the king of Israel. Well, now we're going to talk about him taking out, destroying the house of Ahab, which had been prophesied by God. So first of all, when did these events happen historically? Jehu's reign probably fits somewhere between the years of 890 to 850 B.C., Jehu was king for 28 years, so those 28 years fit somewhere within that window. He was king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Our first main character in this chapter is Jehu, who we just discussed. Second, the relatives of Ahab, they're going to be exterminated by Jehu in this chapter. And then the worshipers of Baal, these were people who were devoted to this Canaanite idol, this false god named Baal. You remember Elijah on Mount Carmel had a confrontation with the prophets of Baal. And then Jehoahaz is our last main character. This is Jehu's son who's going to follow him on the throne of Israel. Now we go to our map. Jehu was at Jezreel at the end of the last chapter, and he is going to kill Ahab's relatives in Jezreel and in the, the city of Samaria in chapter 10. The house or the temple of Baal is mentioned in this chapter, but we're not exactly told where that temple was. We are told that God started breaking up the kingdom of Israel because of their wickedness and their unfaithfulness to him, starting with the land that was on the east side of the Jordan River. This would be the territory that was originally given to the tribes of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. Our outline today has three, I think, three or so sections. Yeah, three. The first one is verses 1 through 17. Jehu kills Ahab's remaining family members. So God had prophesied through Elijah that all of Ahab's descendants would be destroyed. And Jehu determined that now that he was the king of Israel, he was going to be the man who fulfilled that prophecy. Jehu sent messengers to the servants who cared for Ahab's 70 sons in Samaria. And he told them that he intended to destroy Ahab's sons. And so if they wanted to fight him, that they needed to get ready to fight because he was coming. But the servants didn't want to fight Jehu. The text actually tells us that they were afraid of him. So Jehu sent them another message. He told them that if they were really you know, going to be his allies, if they're going to be on his side, what they needed to do was kill all 70 sons of Ahab and then to bring their heads to the city of Jezreel. Well, that's exactly what they did. The servants killed 70 sons of Ahab, loaded their heads into baskets, and sent them to Jezreel where they were piled in two piles by the, uh, by the gate of the city. Nice, right? Jehu then got up and he announced to all of the people that his his desire to kill all of Ahab's descendants was motivated by the word of the, the Lord spoke through the prophet Elijah when he prophesied this destruction of Ahab's household. There was probably also, you know, a political side to this where Jehu is trying to secure his kingdom so he gets rid of all of the potential rivals, right? But uh, probably a little bit of both. Jehu then proceeded to kill all of Ahab's remaining relatives in the city of Jezreel. He killed all of Ahab's relatives in the city of Samaria. Jehu also killed some of the relatives of Ahaziah, who had been the previous king of Judah before Jehu killed him. These were relatives who had actually come up north from Judah into Israel to visit the relatives of Ahab. When they were discovered by Jehu, he killed them too. Section number two, verses 18 through 28, we see Jehu tricking the worshipers and the priests and the devotees of Baal, this false god. Jehu tricked the people of Israel by telling them that he was going to be a Baal worshiper just like Ahab had been a Baal worshiper. So he was going to devote himself to this false god and serve him with even more vigor than Ahab had. In truth, though, he was actually planning to kill all of the Baal worshippers in Israel. And so this is how he went about it. He appointed a special day of worship in the house of Baal. And all the devotees of Baal came and were, were present at this special worship service. Jehu set guards outside, though, 80 of them. He gave them secret orders to kill everyone in, in the temple 
when uh, in Bale's temple when he gave the order. After Jehu finished offering the sacrifice at Baal's temple, his men carried out the order. They killed every worshiper of Baal, the priests of Baal. They demolished the house of Baal, and the ruins of that idol temple were made into a latrine, or like a toilet. The rest of the chapter, verses 29 through 36, tell us about the rest of the reign of Jehu in Israel. Unfortunately, although he started off somewhat well following God's instructions, wanting to fulfill God's prophecies, Jehu didn't honor God during the remainder of his reign. During his time, God started cutting off pieces of the Israelite kingdom, especially the land that was on the right side or the east side of the Jordan River. Jehu died after he reigned 28 years in Israel, and his son Jehoahaz took his place. So that is 2 Kings chapter 10. And now we go down to our application section. Jehu saw himself as the man who was responsible for fulfilling God's prophecy to execute judgment against the house of Ahab. And you'll notice from this chapter that when he took up that responsibility, he completed it with swiftness and with zeal and with boldness. One lesson that we can learn from this, even though Jehu wasn't altogether a, a, a great guy, as disciples of Jesus's, certain responsibilities have been laid at our feet. Do we do our best to complete them with swiftness and zeal? Is there any urgency? Do we feel any urgency in fulfilling our responsibilities? Or are we kind of content to let those things linger, making slow decisions, dragging things out for months, maybe waiting five, ten weeks until the next congregational meeting to get their approval before we take any action? We, as the disciples of Jesus, have work to do, work that cannot wait. There are people in the world without the salvation of Christ, and we should have a real sense of urgency and a belief that our work is too important to be delayed.